Okay, welcome everybody to a new Bytes of Innovation webinar. This is the first webinar in 2023. Uh, my name is Martin Willeming. I'm co-founder and CEO at SecMed. At SecMed, we simplify access to medical imaging data. So if you need medical imaging data, make sure to check out secmed.ai. We also organize Bytes of Innovation, which is a webinar that provides a deep dive into the future of medicine. And we do this together with renowned experts, such as researchers, that, physicians, no, investors, yeah. and lawyers. The concept is 15 minutes of presentation by the expert, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. And this will be moderated by Rachel, uh, who's on this call and is a product manager at SecMed, and by me. So all participants, make sure to put your questions in the chat during the presentation so that we can discuss them at the end during the Q&A phase of the webinar. Of the webinar. Today, I am proud to announce that we have Nina Cutler amongst us. Dr. Nina Cutler, she completed both her bachelor's and her master's in applied mathematics, following which she received her medical degree from the University of Massachusetts. Nina is a radiologist with over 16 years of experience in emergency radiology. And with her background in applied mathematics and optimization theory, she has been using imaging informatics to improve image quality and to drive the value in radiology. Currently, Dr. Kotler is the Associate CMO for Clinical AI and VP of Clinical Operations at Radiology Partners. And she leads their data science and analytics division and oversees the clinical AI for the practice. So Nina is the perfect person to talk about the future of radiology with AI. Nina, the floor is yours. Let me unshare my screen. Sounds good. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for coming. I see all of these pe people on the screen while I'm sharing. That's wonderful. I think it's really important to talk about where we're going because until we have a vision of where we're going, there's no way to know how to get there. And I do think artificial intelligence is going to change how we practice radiology. And I wanna give a different vision than has been given before. So shrink my screen here, all right. So, um, so I think you probably all know Jeff Hinton. He's become famous for, for a really bad reason. He's actually quite a, a great uh, artificial intelligence researcher, but, um, but he has become well known, unfortunately, in the radiology community for this quote, which he gave back in 2016. He said that, I think that if you work as a radiologist, you're like Wiley e. Coyote in the cartoon. You're already over the edge of the cliff, but you haven't looked down. There's no ground underneath. People should just stop training radiologists now. It's just completely obvious that in five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. And five years ago, well, the, I mean, that was 2016. It, we're already past that time, and we really need more radiologists than ever. So I wanted to give a bit of a different feature of where we can go in radiology and forgive the movie reference um, with with Tom, uh, with um, with an actor here pretending to be a radiologist, but just pretend for a moment that a radiologist is interpreting all of the medical imaging that we have now. Okay, so this is similar to today, although the, the screen here is a little different. Mm -hmm. But now we have information from artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence provides us additional structured information that we can then evaluate. And as the radiologist, we need to be the person that's evaluating those results because those results are sometimes accurate, sometimes not accurate. And the radiologist should be able to work with those results directly, make changes. And then the AI should be able to run again directly within our system and provide us those new results. That is the collaboration and integration level that we need to have. Now, I don't think this is going to happen just with artificial intelligence. There's a huge amount of additional information that we can get from the new technology that's out there, including molecular imaging, radiomics, genomics, proteomics, all of the different omics. All of this is structured information that needs to be combined together, and someone needs to understand how to contextualize it how to understand what's accurate and not accurate, and then provide that information back to the referring clinician and perhaps the patient. And to me, that's going to be the role of the radiologist. And you can't take on more than we're doing today unless we take some things off our plate, which I think is what artificial intelligence is going to help us do. Now, if you think about it today, the information that the radiologist is looking at is mostly morphologic imaging. Right? It is 
visible anatomy pathology and trying to derive pathology from what, what looks abnormal in the anatomy. There is also um, some physiologic imaging that we get, but in the future, we have to incorporate a lot more. So what I'm suggesting is that we as radiologists need to move from the imaging expert to the information expert. A ton of data is coming with artificial intelligence, molecular imaging, radiomics, genomics, et cetera. And all of that has to be understood by someone. So my suggestion is that is going to be the radiologist as the consultant's consultant. But in order to do that, we need to develop the expertise. So how do we develop expertise? And that is through education. And I think we need education in all of these things. Since we have a short talk today, what I wanted to talk to you about was a few lessons that we have learned in using artificial intelligence over the years. Okay, so I think a lot of the education you can get is through practice, trial, figuring things out because things aren't standard of care yet. There is no set lessons that are already out there and written for you. Anyone that's using AI is using it as an early adopter and we have to figure out those lessons learned. So here in my practice, we've had a lot of experience using AI over the past five, six years. Uh, we started in 2017. And since that time, we've rolled out uh, artificial intelligence to thousands of radiologists. A lot of the work that we've done is in natural language processing because that has a huge amount of immediate value. But we've also done a lot of work in computer vision. We've had 17 million annual images available to nine different computer vision models. And we've been evaluating those both clinically live and in the background. And so with that amount of information, I wanted to share five five lessons that we've learned that hopefully can help fast forward your education process so that we can get AI to become standard of care. Okay, so let's start with number one. Um, artificial intelligence helps find unexpected findings. Now, artificial intelligence is different than a human. It doesn't look at images the way that we do, and that actually can be good. So if it can find things that we're missing because it's looking at things a different way, well, then that can benefit everyone. So here's a 50 year old male came in with a history of suspected PE. Um, I don't even think that's ICD-10 compliant, but it has, actually is very helpful for us as radiologists because we know what we should be looking for. They're worried about a PE and the radiologist read this correctly. There was no PE. There was also an AI that ran, found no PE. But what we didn't find was this unexpected finding of a rib fracture. Now, this might have been a cause of the pleuritic chest pain and why the physician thought that there was a PE. But generally, we're looking centrally in a different window. It's hard enough to find rib fractures, but when they're unexpected, it's even harder. So I think in this case, we were biased by the history, and, and that's why we missed this finding. 56-year-old male came in with left flank pain, and we did find the cause of the left flank pain. There was an obstructing distal left ureteral calculus causing hydronephrosis and all of that inflammation around the kidney. But what we missed are these two really tiny foci of uh, free gas that were unexpected, and it was found by the AI, uh, not found by the radiologist. And in this case, I think we were biased by our satisfaction of search. Here's a 52 year old male that came in with shortness of breath. And this was during the Delta wave of COVID. So you can see there's COVID pneumonia here. And in that background of COVID pneumonia, it's actually quite hard to find these very small pulmonary emboli. Uh, the radiologist didn't, didn't find them, but the AI did. Now the AI is just looking for pulmonary emboli. It wasn't looking, care about what the background is, uh, but the radiologist does, and we are biased by distracting pathology. Um, so of course, what do you do for a stroke exam? You get a CTA of the head and neck, and, and this is the study we got. Now, when you're looking at a CTA, you're looking here centrally at the vessels, the anterior circulation, the posterior circulation, and the RAD read this completely correctly. The AI agreed there, there was no uh, vessel occlusion, there was no dissection, no issue causing the stroke, but what we missed was this cervical spine um, posterior element fracture that is not something that you're generally concentrating on uh, looking at bone windows and looking posteriorly here in the spine. But the AI did pick this up. And I think when you are biased by the exam selection, you're looking for a very particular thing. It makes it harder to find the other things. This is another similar exam, 47 year old male with subarachnoid hemorrhage and headache. You can see the subarachnoid hemorrhage here and the hydrocephalus dilated temporal horns. 
on this non-contrast head CT. And so what are you going to get? It's a young patient. You're thinking about a ruptured aneurysm. So we went ahead and got a, a CTA of the head. And the most common location for an aneurysm is the circle of Willis. And we concentrate there because we've learned from our education that that is the most common place to find something. And there was no ruptured aneurysm or aneurysm in this location. However, what the AI found and the radiologist did not was an aneurysm in a very unusual location down at the skull base. It's, um, it's a five millimeter aneurysm coming off the left pica, which is a branch of the vertebral artery. And it's not something that we commonly see, but I'll tell you, we found two of these in the time that we rolled out uh, AI looking for brain aneurysm. And it's because as radiologists, we're just not used to, we look in the most common locations. And unless you've seen something more recently, it, it's hard to look really closely in other locations. So I've been talking a lot about bias and bias gets a bit of a negative rap, which in many ways it should, but I wanted to provide a different perspective on bias. And it's the reason why AI and radiology are, are better together. Now, what I always learned when I was a resident was the highest quality combination was a resident and attending. So even as a young resident, I felt like I was helping because the attending has been educated over time and had a lot of lessons that they've learned. And they look in the very common locations, the places that they're, they know they're going to find something or uncommon locations that they've recently seen things just based on their history, right? That that bias helps them find subtle things that they would otherwise miss. And a resident, a younger resident, we don't know where to look. So we look everywhere on the bones <laughs> and we may call up some things that, that may be false positives, but with the attending, they can help resolve that. Now, I think in the future, the highest quality, quality combination is going to be a radiologist plus AI. So similarly, a educated radiologist or an experienced radiologist is going to be looking at certain key locations. The AI looks at every pixel of the image or generally every voxel of the image, but then it's going to concentrate only on certain areas. And those areas, if they don't overlap exactly with the areas that we're looking at, well, then that can add to our value. It can add to the sensitivity. And I'll tell you that brain aneurysm case that we were looking at, we evaluated a thousand brain aneurysm cases. And we looked at what the AI said, and we looked at what the radiologist said, and what we found was that the AI improved the radiologist sensitivity by 24%. So when you put them together, it, it helps. Now, interestingly, if you just went by what the AI said, the radiologist would have improved the AI sensitivity by 34%. Okay, so that was lesson number one. Lesson number two, AI helps radiologists find subtle findings. And we did find this most of the time. You know, like I said, we've run these through thousands and thousands of cases. And most of the time, what the AI is adding are these super subtle findings. And even if you're a radiologist looking at these, these are very subtle findings to, to see. So I'll put on the heat maps to show you where they are, but they're for multiple different models. And this was typical. Um, now, does every AI model find subtle findings? Because if they're only finding the common ones, well, then they're not really helping you. And I'll tell you that AI's value grows exponentially once you get past an accuracy tipping point. So you have to increase your sensitivity enough to find these things. So most of the value happens once the sensitivity is above around 95%. If you're down at the 50s, 60s, or even 90%, you're finding things that you as a radiologist are probably easily finding yourself. And so what you want is something that's a little more sensitive that can help you detect um, those subtle findings that are going to make the difference. All right, so lesson number two, AI helps find subtle findings, but only if you have a highly sensitive model. Lesson number three, AI might detect things that humans can't see. And this is where things get really interesting. I was completely floored by this case. So this was a 70 year old male who came in with right-sided paralysis and word salad. So like you're, you're thinking Wernicke's, uh, there's gonna be a stroke in, in that area. And we got the CTA and we ran it through our large vessel occlusion model to look for a, an occlusion in the M1 segment. And we're specifically looking at the left M1 um, to, to find the stroke. And we, we didn't see anything. In fact, the CTA was completely normal in that area. And on the left-hand side, I put up the axial image. And on the right-hand side, I put up the 3D reconstruction because you can follow that uh, MCA all the way out. And there really is nothing that you could see that's discontinuous that would be causing this. But the AI picked up something. 
right there centrally within the M1 segment. And, um, and it was kind of astonishing. But when you looked back at the non-contrast head CT, which luckily we also have, right? You get that first and we do evaluate those. You can see a density within the left MCA, right? A dense MCA sign. And that is a sign for a thrombus within the M1 segment that because of the density of it, we just couldn't pick it up. It was very similar to the contrast opacification. Couldn't see it, pretty small. Um, but the AI did pick it up. The AI was not looking at the non-contrast head CT. The AI was looking at the CTA. So here's um, actually the stroke. And then, um, and it was in Wernicke's area, which caused the, the patient's paralysis in word salad. Okay, next case, 80-year-old male with shortness of breath and chest pain. Um, they were looking for PE. And we, we generally will look on, I mean, you get all different kinds of slice thicknesses. They usually take them at maybe 0.625, but they may not even always send you the 0.625 slices. That's sometimes hard for the network to manage. So we may either only get the two millimeters or three millimeters, or we may only look at those as sort of standard of care. And I think on this two millimeter slice thickness, it's very hard to see this small PE. But when you look on the 0.625s, it's a lot easier to see. And generally we, we try, or we always should be sending the thinnest slice images to our AI model. Um, it's going to be higher quality for them and higher quality for us because we can then have something else that is looking at those in case we're going to miss it. Here's another case where on the left is a thinner slice, uh, on the right is a little bit thicker slice, but definitely standard of care for an abdomen pelvis. Very hard to see this rib fracture on the slightly thicker standard of care slices, a little bit easier to see on the 1.25s. And that both of these were picked up by the AI and, and not by the RAD. And I think that's hard in these cases. So lesson number three is AI might detect some things that we can't see. And that suggests to us how we should be working with AI. Right? Maybe in the future, we should be letting the AI look at those super thin slices, but should we as humans be doing that? No, we'd probably be wasting our time, but if we have the AI look at it, it can, um, it can allow us to pick up things that we might have otherwise missed. This is how we integrate AI and radiology together. All right, let's go on to the last two. Lesson number four, RADs can also help improve the AI accuracy. Now I've been talking about how AI is so great and it is picking up things that RADs miss, but it goes both directions. And just for a couple of examples, but I'll tell you, I have plenty of these. RADs must dismiss false positives. So this is pretty obvious, right? There's non-contrast head CT, the patient's moving. We get this frequently, their streak artifact. You may get streak artifact from, from metal uh, that's out there. And all of these were called positive for intracranial hemorrhage by the AI. Now these are very easy for us to dismiss. And I think that's fine. It's okay if AI calls something that's a false positive that's easy for me to dismiss. What I don't like is why AI calls a false positive that's hard for me to dismiss. So here's another example, 66 year old male came in with fever, coffee ground emesis, and the AI model ran for free air in this and it picked up the gas that's just next to the stomach. And, and it's a little obvious to see on this image, but I'll tell you, I had a bunch of other cases where there was gas in a little diverticula or gas in the tip of the appendix that was picked up by the AI. And, um, and it tells you that AI is looking at things in a different way that we are. Now we're looking at things in three dimensions. We're not always looking at every coronal and sagittal to follow the bowel, but we're certainly following the bowel going up and down as we're, as we're going through the abdomen. The AI is not. The AI is not looking at anatomy in 3D the way that we are. I mean, it's looking at a thin voxel of slices, but what it does, it can mistake some free air for something that is really just connected to the bowel, as you can see in this case, because it's not looking at the full anatomy that we are in the same way that we are. Now, again, that's good. Um, here's another case, 93-year-old male who had a fall. There were actually two C-spine fractures in this one, and AI picked up one of them, but the second one was this fracture that was parallel with the sagittal plane. And the AI is not looking at every series of every CT exam. In fact, it's usually looking at one series. And in this case, for a C-spine fracture, it's looking at the sagittal series much harder to pick up a fracture that is sagittally oriented, where you just go from seeing bone to no bone to bone. It's very hard to pick that up, especially if you're not looking at it in thicker voxels of imaging. And so this one was one that the radiologist picked up, but the AI missed. 
Okay, 65 year old, the last case here, 65 year old female with headache. And this was one that ran through the intracranial hemorrhage model. And it did pick up this um, high density here in the basal ganglia, which I think is appropriate to pick up. Uh, but if you um, look at the prior, which the radiologist has, but generally the AI is not looking at, you can see that this hasn't changed for years. And so we could more confidently call this uh, not hemorrhage, but calcification, whereas the uh, the AI model is going to call it hemorrhage. All right, so lesson number five, radiologists and AI are better together. And hopefully you've learned this lesson already, but let's go back to that very first case of that 50-year-old male with suspected PE where the AI picked up that rib fracture that was unexpected and fabulous, so good it picked that up. It actually sent this case to me and I got a chance to look at it. So I said, all right, there's a rib fracture, let me go in. And when I went in with that bias of looking very specifically for rib fracture, I was able to find three more rib fractures that the AI did not. And I think this is how we're going to be working with AI in the future. The AI will pick up something that we might've missed. That's okay. But then we as radiologists prime our brain to look for something like that or a pathology related to that, maybe a subtle pneumothorax, and we'll pick up stuff that the AI didn't find. That's how we integrate the two together. And I will tell you, I have lots of examples where the AI directed me to a finding, but then I went and found way more than the AI did because my brain was primed to look very specifically in that area as opposed to looking for everything. All right, so the future of radiology, I think there is going to be a human cybernetic collaboration. We need to be integrated together. And that's why I showed you that case in the beginning, that vision um, that we will need to have the AI directly integrated into our systems and running in our system so that when we work with the AI, maybe we agree, maybe we disagree, the AI can run again, taking that information into account. So I put together a little depiction of what I think um, some of the lessons that we've learned on, on what the AI should be concentrating on and what radiologists should be concentrating on. It would be an absolute waste if we all concentrated on everything. Again, this is about how do we integrate the things that we do well as radiologists and the things that AI does well as a computer system working together. And that's how you take the best of both and one plus one equals three. That's how you get to the next level. And in, in healthcare right now, we can't think about just replacing things that we do. We need to think about adding value, doing more than we're able to do today. And I think this is the method by which we can get there. All right, so today we talked about a few things. We talked about the future of radiology is bright. I think we're gonna need radiologists more than ever. If we can have AI helping us with some of those things that we can do, we can elevate our role to take in more information. And that takes education. We need to understand how these things work so that we can be the experts. And in that, we talked about five lessons about how radiologists will work together with AI. And it's more about augmentation of our capabilities. And of course, the most important lesson is that radiologists and AI are better together. So with that, I'd like to say thank you, and I will pause in case there's any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nina. Uh, this presentation is super informative, I think, for people who are a little bit new to the space and for experts, of which there are many in this call. So right now, the floor is open for questions. If you have anything, feel free to drop it in the chat. And given the time that we have left, I'll just start with one from Michelle. And Michelle asks, would the level that the radiologist improves the AI decrease over time as the AI continues to learn? So yes, it's a really great question. Um, but right now it's actually not applicable and not a lot of people know this, but the way that the FDA works, right? If you have a model that is going to affect patient care, it has to be run through the FDA. And the FDA clears or approves a model at a point in time. They don't feel comfortable enough approving a model that is allowed to change over time because they don't feel they have control over what that change is going to be. And so when a AI vendor goes to sell their product, well, it has to go through clearance. They basically have it frozen. And I think that's actually a benefit for us right now because it can allow us to learn how the AI works and then we can adapt to learn together. I do think it's gonna be harder once the FDA, and it will probably take another year or so, they are working on it. You know, How do you not approve the actual model, but do you approve the process and the business that's, that's managing that? 
Uh, I do think it will be harder and we'll have to figure out new lessons learned and new ways to work together. The good thing is that we as humans are very adaptable uh, and we can adapt much more quickly. This is just giving us the time to get our feet wet, to get some expertise. And then as AI models are evolving, we will hopefully learn how to evolve quickly with them. Thank you for that. Um, I'll follow up with a question from Matt, also in the chat. Matt asks, <clears throat> does having a very high sensitivity, so greater than 50%, lead to more false positives than a radiologist would have to go through? Yes, um, it, it does. Now, when you're looking at an AI model, I, I don't look just at the numbers, uh, and maybe I could give another talk on this sometime, but you have to look at things a little more deeply. And for me, when you're looking at an AI model that is finding a pathologic finding, you're looking for a positive finding. I'm looking at two things. I'm looking at the positive predictive value, which is exactly what you're saying. How often is that test right when it says there's a positive test? And if you have a very sensitive model, you're going to get more false positives. So your positive predictive value is gonna be less. Now, your positive predictive value is affected even more by the prevalence of disease than it is by the sensitivity or specificity of a model. So it's actually your prevalence is driving that. And a lot of our pathology is not that prevalent in our, in our case, um, intracranial hemorrhage, we see it in 5% of patients, 7% for PE. If it's an incidental PE, it's even smaller. Brain aneurysm, small. So all of those things that have a very low prevalence, especially below 1%, are very hard for AI because that positive predictive value is going to be low because of the low prevalence. Now, if you have a highly sensitive model, however, then you're going to find pick up some cases that are really astounding, some cases that you as a radiologist look at and you say, wow, that was fantastic. That really helped me. So what you do is you want to balance that positive predictive value, which sometimes is out of your control because it's based on prevalence with those wow cases. And if you don't have those wow cases from a very sensitive model and you just have the negatives of positive predictive value, you're going to be miserable. You're going to hate it. So I think having a more sensitive model, even though it causes a few more false positives is way better than a model that's not going to give you any of those wow cases. And then your balance is going to be completely off. You're going to have your low positive predictive value with nothing to, to weigh it out. So it is a balance, but you also want to look at the kinds of things that the false positives that you're given. If, like I mentioned, if you're given a false positive that you can dismiss quickly because of motion artifact or something, easy peasy. Uh, but if you're given a false positive that's hard to dismiss, then that makes more of a difference. And that's why we take time in our practice to try to categorize all of the false positive types that we see. And we educate our radiologists about them so that they can go through them more quickly. Yeah, that totally makes sense. The radiologist has a gatekeeper function here as well, right? Where the AI says something, but the radiologist, you know, that shows the value of the radiologist won't go away with the AI. There will always have to be somebody that actually looks at, okay, is this actually relevant or is this, you know, are we too sensitive right now? Um, in line with this question, uh, Mircea Popa asks, uh, you know, the balance between sensitivity and specificity. So if the sensitivity needs to be above 95%, what about specificity? Shouldn't that also be above 95% then? It, it should, absolutely. In fact, if you decrease or if you increase your specificity from 90 to 95%, you cut your false positives in half. So super important. Um, it is why we need really accurate models, but uh, when you're going out there and you're looking at the accuracies that are published by the vendors, don't just take them at face value. That is not necessarily gonna be the accuracy on your patient population. So I'd encourage you to try it on your patient population. You want to look at sensitivity and specificity, but again, look at positive predictive value. Negative predictive value is also a really good one because that's what makes you as a radiologist more efficient. When you think about 95% of your head CTs are not going to have intracranial hemorrhage. Only 5% are. It's the negative studies that are driving your efficiency. So if it has a high negative predictive value, that's also really helpful. Yeah, totally. So we have many more questions in the chat, and I have a thousand questions that I want to ask you, but I uh, we are we are running out of time, unfortunately. So Nina, thank you very much for a super interesting uh, presentation. It was great to have you here. Uh, thanks everybody for attending this, uh, this Bytes of Innovation and we hope to see you next time at Bytes of Innovation again. Thanks everybody.